welcome to the Alex Salmon Show where we climax our series on Wither Catalonia. In the aftermath of the Spanish elections, is there any hope of a breakthrough to reconcile the independence ambitions of the rebellious province with the determination of the Spanish state to make no further concessions? We report from Barcelona, featuring interviews with some of those driving the grassroots demands for political change. But first, over to Alex with your tweets, emails and messages on our Catalonian series. Now, Gordon says, talking about the first of our series in Catalonia, he says that the programme he found emotional and inspirational, uh, talking to the wives of two of the imprisoned Catalan leaders. Uh, and Morag was uh, impressed with the interview with Liz Castro, the, the American in Barcelona. She liked the description of Liz as the Lafayette of the, of the Catalan Revolution. Now, we haven't had a response from the, the, the Spanish government, particularly on the, the issue of the terms of imprisonment of the Catalan leaders. But here's a, a reminder of what uh, Pedro Sanchez had to say in the Washington Post of October the 14th. In a social and democratic state of law, compliance means full compliance. This has been a judicial process with full guarantees and transparency. The government of Spain will work in the coming days towards guaranteeing public order and protecting our democratic laws as it has always done. But David MacDonald uh, begs to differ. He says the European Union needs to help put pressure on the Spanish government. And we'll be taking up that issue with uh, diplomat Craig Murray uh, later in this program. Uh, and then Bertha uh, writes, she says, this should be followed. Very interesting. Diplomacy is the solution. War is not a cup of tea. Peace and development is what everyone wants. So diplomacy and dialogue is the solution. War and violence is not a cup of tea or coffee. Uh, and Bertha's watching a show from Kenya in Africa. Now, over to Taz. In the first of our programmes on the Catalonian crisis, we focused on the wives of the independence campaigners sentenced to long periods of imprisonment. These prisoners have become the rallying point of the Catalan movement. In our second, we explored with the Catalan minister whether the confrontation between Catalonia and Spain may move from the streets to online. In this programme, we examine how the movement for Catalan independence has developed from the grassroots upwards. And we explore with an interested international observer how the standoff between the Spanish state and Catalonia might be resolved. In many campaigns internationally, stretching from the anti-Vietnam War protests in America to current events in Hong Kong, students have been in the vanguard of protest. Catalonia is no different, with students from the University of Barcelona camped out for weeks in support of the imprisoned independence campaigners. Alex joined them to discuss their campaign. Well, here in University Square, in the very centre of Barcelona, instead of attending to their studies, the students in Barcelona are out here encamped outside their university. What on earth are you doing camped out here? Uh, well, this is uh, we're here as a reaction to uh, a sentencing um, made by the, uh, the Spanish Supreme Court, uh, which uh, had sentenced some of our political leaders to jail for giving us a referendum so that we could uh, self-determinate our future as a Catalan people. So uh, do you have demands? Are you saying, look, we are going to be here until you concede what? Our demands are um, the amnesty of our political prisoners, of all political prisoners, um, a, f a uh, free, a dignified future, um, and the end of repression. When you're camped out here, uh, and this camp's been established for how long? Just a, a Tomorrow will be a week. And you're determined to stay here. I mean, do you have debates? Or, or are you doing your lectures at the same time? Or are you having discussions? Uh, so is, this, is, this a kind of, is there a social life to this camp as well as a political message? So, of course, there's a social uh, aspect to this camp. Um, everything has a, a basis in the fight that all of us here share. We organise everything from... Um, de debates between the different people who are here camped to uh, different speakers who come and tell us about all sorts of different issues. We have people who've come and um, talked about different ways of protecting ourselves and also uh, we had people come and talk to us about the situation in Kurdistan and South, South America too, different fights that are um, going on parallelly in, in the rest of the so world. So you're looking not just at the situation in Catalonia but looking to the wider world? To... Well, we believe that our fight um, is part of a more global issue that um, involves many other people who are also oppressed by different 
oppressive regimes. And so that's something that we think is important, even though what we're here fighting for, we know is a very, is, is a more concrete issue. Well, it seems to be pretty uh, overwhelming from the young people camped out here outside the University of Barcelona and, and the University Square, that they are very hopeful that there'll be a better future for Catalonia and very determined to stay here until they secure that future. Craig Murray, as a, a former British ambassador, can you explain to, to our viewers why, despite the public sympathy for the Catalan cause, which is evident across many countries, they've had little or no support from individual European governments, or for that matter, from the institutions of the European Union? Well, it really has been quite striking that there has been uh, very little support for the Catalans on, on the diplomatic front. And in particular within the European Union, it, it's been extremely striking that there has been no support for them from the Commission or the Council or the Parliament, uh, and particularly at the time of the, uh, uh, you know, the violent suppression of a Catalan referendum. All three of those uh, European Union institutions came out uh, in fairly strong support of the actions of the Spanish government, saying it was all part of the, of the rule of law. And do you think perhaps that the Catalans will have better prospects in the, uh, in the Council of Europe in, in Strasbourg? I remember back in uh, 2017, the then acting head, acting president of, of the Council, made a, a strong statement of condemnation of the actions of the Spanish authorities. Might Strasbourg be a, a better vehicle for Catalan uh, canvassing for support than, uh, than Brussels? Strasbourg is, is going to be more hopeful because, of course, uh, Strasbourg and the Council of Europe are uh, particularly tasked with uh, institutions of good government, questions of self-determination and questions of, of human rights. So it is very much in their domain. And also they have no uh, economic remit, so the stability of the currency uh, or, or the future of the Spanish economy is not, not so much their concern. So yes, there, there will be uh, more of a chance of eventual redress from the Council of Europe and of course from the uh, Court, European Court of Human Rights, which is a Council of Europe institution, not a European Union institution. Uh, but the, these things grind slowly. And remember, of course, that governments still do have, have great influence on many of the representatives within the Council of Europe. So if you were advising the, the, the Catalan government at the present moment, or indeed the wider uh, Catalan cause, how would you tell them to, to frame their diplomatic offensive to try and turn round uh, the, the shut doors they're getting from most of the, the countries in Europe? I would tell them primarily to look outside Europe. Uh, I, I would tell them to go to the developing world, the G77 countries as we call them in, in diplomatic speak, and to frame um, uh, Catalonia's desire for independence uh, in respect of the right of self-determination uh, and, and, and to seek to operate through the United Nations and the United Nations General Assembly. One of the relatively few crumbs of comfort that Catalonia has received in terms of international support has been the refusal of a number of jurisdictions uh, to service the European arrest warrants that uh, Spanish government uh, taken out against uh, Carlos Puigdemont, against Clara Pensati in Scotland. What's your reading of the situation that now that the Spanish government have come back with a, a new improved version of an arrest warrant, are they going to get their way or will the jurisdictions continue to, to hold out against deporting these people? Well, I'm still extremely hopeful that the judicial systems of, of, of European states will, will be resistant to the, the, the Spanish efforts because, um, you know, plainly, uh, there are breaches here of, of the rights of uh, freedom of speech, of freedom of assembly, the right of self-determination. And you know, plainly, they, Spain is trying to get still more political prisoners after imposing absolutely vicious sentences on, on, on people who are campaigning for self-determination. So uh, you know, courts tend to take a more reasoned view of these things than politicians do. So I am hopeful, uh, particularly here in Scotland, uh, that the courts will, will resist these, these politically motivated arrest warrants. But I will say uh, that um, I'm fairly disgusted that the prosecuting authorities, who are of course much uh, uh, more susceptible to political influence, are taking forward the arrest warrants to the courts at all. I mean, the Crown here in Scotland should be saying, 
This is plainly uh, politically motivated. They should not be saying that the charge is the equivalent of a UK charge of treason, which is a remarkable uh, thing which the, 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 uh, the Crown here in Scotland is, is resting its case upon. This is still a very grave and, and worrying situation. So in summary, I mean, the, the Catalans got tremendous support for the way they conducted themselves peacefully during the 2017 referendum. They've won the Catalan elections. For the first time, they've emerged leading in the Spanish elections in Catalonia. There is clearly a substantial majority in favour of a referendum if the case for independence is much more evenly divided. So what exactly does the Catalan politicians, do the Catalan cause do to progress uh, their desire for a referendum? Well, I think they have, to, they have to keep on doing what they're doing. And of course, they have to assert you know, the obvious that Catalonia is a nation. It, it, it has its own language, it has its own political institutions, and it has a long history of previous autonomy. So uh, all these are the factors they have to work upon. But it, it's going to be a hard road. You know, they, they are facing a, a state willing to use extreme violence against them and allowing no form of democratic expression. So to keep to the path of nonviolence as, as, as time goes on it is going to be extremely difficult. Uh, an emerging new front in, in the struggle for, for Catalonia is the, the social media, obviously heavily used by the Catalan campaigners. Now that they fear, according to the Catalan government, that the Spanish government have taken powers to virtually interrupt, wipe out, close down the internet uh, uh, across Barcelona, what fears would you have that this might be a, a tactic used by other governments internationally? Well, it's quite remarkable to see you know, a European government taking these kind of draconian powers. We've just seen uh, precisely this kind of action done in Iran in the last couple of weeks to stop protest there. Uh, and we've seen similar things before in Hong Kong and other parts of China. Uh, you don't expect to see it in Europe. But ultimately, if the Spanish government is going to seek to suppress uh, Catalan independence by, by means of repression, it's going to have to take more and more draconian steps to crush civil society. So I'm not in the least surprised. Craig Murray from Edinburgh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Join us after the break when Alex discusses the Catalonia movement with the leader of one of the grassroots organisations who provided the engine for change in the rebellious province. Welcome back. The Catalan struggle for independence has had huge currency in international terms, but few really understand the intertwined nature of the various organisations supporting a move towards independence. The Catalan movement is represented not by one political party, but by three, and much of its influence comes upwards from grassroots cultural and citizens' organisations. Alex caught up with Elisenda Paluzzi in Barcelona, leader of the Catalan National Assembly. Welcome back to the show, Elisenda. Thanks, thanks for inviting me again. Now tell the, the viewers a bit about the, what is the Catalan National Assembly? That's not a parliament. That, that, this no. is a, a, a grassroots organisation. That, that yeah, really... Assembly is not a parliament. It's a civil so society organisation that was created in 2012 and that has a single aim, is to fight for Catalan independence through democratic and pacific means. And it's uh, ideologically diverse, so we can have uh, in our memberships, uh, leftist people, people that are more centre-right, it's uh, very diverse. And what sort of activities does the, the National Assembly, how, I mean, what support does it provide to the, the independence movement in Catalonia? Well, the first thing that we did and that was uh, rendered us famous was to organise a big, big demonstration in 2012 during the Catalan National Day. So one of our activities is mobilising civil society, organising large demonstrations. But we've been doing many other things, like uh, campaigning for the yes to independence, uh, when we had the referendum uh, in 2017, and also during the participatory process in 2014. So giving arguments in favour of independence, and um, we do that through also our experts, economists, lawyers, and different experts uh, that are also a part of the of the association. So you're looking to support uh, independence, uh, supporting candidates and politicians 
not, not just in political parties and government office, but through all the institutions of, uh, of Catalonia. Yes, because this is something that we realized in October 2017. It's like the power is not only in the formal institutions in government, uh, the power and the Spanish state power um, has, uh, um, is spread in other institutions of the civil society, especially in business institutions. We saw that in October when they, some of these institutions participated in the FEAR campaign. So what we said is that uh, if we want to succeed, when we do another attempt to declare independence, and this time it has to be a definitive um, attempt, we have to be more prepared and uh, we have to have more power in this type of institutions. Uh, we have to, um, these institutions shouldn't be collaborating um, with the Spanish power in the sense that they are collaborating in not respecting the will of the Catalan people or the decisions of the Catalan parliament. They have to be at least neutral. Now, since we, we last spoke in the, in the show last year, the, uh, the sentences have been handed down for the independence campaigners, nine people sentenced collectively to almost 100 years of uh, imprisonment. Uh, what has been the impact of these draconian sentences on the, the Catalan independence movement? The society is really touched, I think, by this verdict and by these sentences, and also the reaction of the Spanish state by doing more repression, by using, uh, and again, uh, the police uh, that is acting quite violently, and also with an increase in the political repression, but by sending all these youngsters to pre-trial detention again. We have now 45 people in, in pre-trial detention in jail. So uh, the situation is quite complex and complicated now. But how does the national movement in Catalonia avoid being drawn in uh, to claims of violence, which would one of your greatest uh, mm. promotional points in world opinion has been this is an example like Gandhi uh, mm. uh, 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 a century ago of a, yeah. a totally peaceful protest. Yeah, it's difficult when uh, the, they have just condemned the leader, the former leader of the Catalan National Assembly and that of another association to nine, nine years of jail when the, what they were doing in September 2017 was trying to calm down a protest uh, and send people home and saying, no, 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 mm, let's stop the protest now. Uh, and, and they have been condemned for sedition for these peaceful mm, demonstrations. So it's very difficult that, um, to, to, mm, that the students, the young people, uh, do not react to that, saying, oh, what, see what happens when you do things uh, peacefully, no? Uh, the, the, the central government will, and the institutions, and the, the, the judge is going to condemn you as if you have were, ha, had used violence, no? So, so it's difficult, but we have to try. We have to try to, to, to keep a, a, a track of non-violence, which doesn't mean exactly pacifism. It's not exactly the same, because non-violence is a strategy that implies an action. It's not doing nothing, it's acting against this um, oppression, against this state that is um, violating fundamental rights and trying to weaken it by acting, by using sometimes even civil disobedience, but under strict principles of non-violence. So we have to hold. So what you're saying, Alessandra, is that the principle of the Catalan National Assembly unambiguously is non-violent action but non-violent action at all times. Yes, the principle of the Catalan National Assembly is unambiguously, unambiguously non-violent action. But you yourself have come under investigation recently, as mm. have many others in Catalonia. How does it feel, given what you've seen happening to many of your colleagues, that you yourself are now under investigation for what you may have said or may not have said in a a television or radio interview? They ask me if uh, all these clashes at night were having a negative impact uh, on the movement and I, I was trying to make a reflection 
Uh, so I said yes, but it is true also that they make visible the conflict in the international press because the world is what it is, and normally the the press at, attaches more importance to negative news than positive news. So I was trying to make a reflection, and now I'm under investigation for having appealed to violence. So it is uh, this limitation on the freedom of speech that we are enduring. This uh, atmosphere must be quite intimidating for, for people. I mean, there is the demonstration of nine people incarcerated for long sentences. There are other people under investigation. That must be quite an intimidating atmosphere for people in the, the national movement in, in Catalonia. Yes, it is intimidating. We, we have to deal with a new experience, is that trying to fight for our ideas in a context of political repression. Now, there's been news recently that the Spanish government are, are, are taking moves to have new powers to intercept social media and stop social media communication. Now, given that one of the great strengths of the, the Catalan movement has been the ability to mobilize and organize using inventively the social media, how big a, a threat do you see that latest move uh, to the, the way you organize? It is a big threat. In fact, uh, uh, the website of the Catalan National Assembly in 2017 was already cut or stopped without a warrant. But then, as they didn't do it right, we were able to recover it. Uh, with this new decree of the Spanish government, now they, they, they are allowed to do it without a warrant. So it's going to, be, um, it's going to introduce more limitations to, to our activity because they are going to try to put you in jail for trying to make into practice this political objective. And also they are going to limitate um, the movement so that you cannot spread your ideas freely. But might this be a strange way, an opportunity to mobilize support in elsewhere in Spain? Because uh, uh, governments which move against uh, the social media are effectively potentially moving against large sections, particularly of the younger population, <laughs> to whom the, the social media is uh, mm. all-encompassing in their lives. And many people will be wary of the idea of, of governments taking a license to intercept and to, and to block people's communications. Yes, it's true, and this is something that we, we are trying to do, like in our campaigns in, inter, in the international arena. Uh, for instance, the fact that the what they did in a website uh, for the tsunami movement. Um, in this website, only China, Russia, and um, Spain have tried to, to block any uh, a web for being um, deposited in that in that um, in that place. No, I think Turkey might have had a, a, an attempt as well. But uh, the, the, a number of countries have tried. You're a, an economist as, as well as a, a, a non-party political activist. What's your impression of how the Catalan economy has performed during a, a period of great uh, instability? Mm. Can you say mm. damage to the economy or, or are there upsides to Catalonia being a, a place which is widely reported? In fact, we are in a global economy and what affects uh, more strongly the Catalan economy is the international economic context. So during the period of turmoil of the Catalan referendum, declaration of independence and the fear campaign, uh, the Catalan economy grew at a pace that was um, stronger than that of the average Spanish economy or even the average Euro European economy. Um, and now uh, we are entering as the rest of Europe a uh, period of uh, recession, probably, uh, but it's that that affects the Catalan economy, not the political conflict. What now for the Catalan National Assembly? I mean, how, how do you intend to progress your campaign? Uh, and how hopeful are you of, uh, of success mm. in the, the medium term? We would like to restart again a campaign on the arguments in favor of independence. Because what happens with political repression is that you are only talking about that, about the people that are detained, the people that are being investigated, and you, you stop 
talking about what moved you in the first place to defend independence for your country. And I think it's important to, to put these arguments again, because now we have more arguments than we had at the beginning. A few years ago, or when the Catalan National Assembly was created, we had arguments in the social arguments, economic arguments, cultural and linguistic arguments to defend a, a, a Catalan state for Catalonia. Uh, but now we have more arguments. We have, we have seen how it is to live uh, in a Spanish state that is willing to vol violate fundamental rights in order to preserve unity of Spain. Uh, who would like to, to continue to be part of a state such as this one? So we have to wrap these things up again and try to, try to campaign again with strong arguments for independence. So the, the grassroots campaign goes on? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. In our series on Catalonia, we have sought to explain the nature of the movement for Catalan independence and the tough reaction of the Spanish state against these ambitions. Inevitably, this has largely featured the views of the Catalan campaigners, as the new Spanish government are reluctant to engage in anything other than the briefest of statements. The inconclusive outcome of the Spanish election provides some basis for dialogue with Prime Minister Sanchez, short of the numbers required to secure his position in the Cortes, and the largest Catalan independence party, the ERC, opening the doors to support in exchange for talks. However, any move to appease Catalan ambitions will be pounced on by the right-wing opposition, whose electoral success has been largely built on a hardline approach towards Catalonia. It will be interesting to see if the circle can be squared, because a continued constitutional standoff seems neither to the benefit of Catalonia or Spain. Now, next Thursday is general election polling day in the United Kingdom, and with political coverage strictly limited, we'll present a compilation of the highlights of some of our shows featuring international issues. However, the following week, we summon once again our prestigious panel of political pundits who will examine the post-election landscape in the United Kingdom and what might be the spectres of Christmases yet to come. But until then, from Alex and me and all at the show, it's goodbye, and we hope to see you all next week.